In June, a package came from Montana, all cheery and colorful with stamps and purple postage marks. It contained, among other things, a pair of child-sized cowboy boots, still years too big for Duane Ray, and a beautiful calfskin belt for Luann. It was carved or stamped somehow with acorns, oak leaves, and her name. There was also a red and black Indian beaded hair clip, which was, of course, no use to Luann at this particular point in, her, in the life of her hair. Angel, on hell, had changed his mind about the divorce. He missed her. He wanted her to come up and live in Montana or something in something called a yurt, if that was not an acceptable option, and then he would come back to Tucson to live with her. What the hell's a yurt, anyway? Luann asked. Sounds like dirt. Beats me, I said. Look it up. She did. A circular dome tent of skins stretched over a lattice framework, she read, pronouncing each word slowly without a Kentucky accent. She pronounced the ah like the letter A, used by the Mongol nomads of Siberia. As they say in the papers, I withheld comment. So what do you think, Taylor? Do you think it would have a floor or plaster walls inside, anything like that? You think the bugs would get in? What popped into my head was, George eats old gray rutabagas and plasters his yurt. The part I can't go get over is that he asked for me. He actually says here that he misses me. She mulled it over and over, twisting her gold wedding band around her finger. She had stopped wearing it about the time she started working at the salsa factory, but now had put it on again, almost guiltily, as though Angel might have packed a spy into the box along with the belt and the boots. But I've got responsibilities now, she argued with herself, certainly because she argued with herself, certainly because I was giving no advice one way or the other. I'm at Red Hot Mama's. This was surely true. In just three weeks' time, she had been promoted to floor manager, setting some kind of company record, but she refused to see this as proof that she was a good worker. They just didn't have anybody else to do it, she insisted. Practically everybody there is 15 years old or worse. Sometimes they send over retardeds from that helpless program, or whatever the heck it's called. It's called the Help Yourself program, and you know it, so don't try to change the subject. The word is handicapped, not retardeds. Right, that's what I meant. What about that woman you told me about that breeds Pekingese and drives a baby blue Trans Am? What's her name that gave you the I Heart My Cat bumper stickers? And what about the guy that's building a hot air blimp in his backyard? Are they 15? No. She was flipping the dictionary open and closed, staring out the window. And Sal Minnelli, how old's he? Luann rolled her eyes. Sal Minnelli was an unfortunate fellow whose name had struck such terror in her heart she forbade him to touch any food item that wasn't sealed and crated. Luann's life was ruled by the fear of salmonella, to the extent that she claimed the only safe way to eat potato salad was to stick your head in the refrigerator and eat it in there. He actually wants me to go, she kept repeating, and even though she said she wasn't going to make up her mind right away, I felt in my bones that sooner or later she would go. If I knew Luann, she would go. It seemed like the world was coming apart at the gussets. Maddie had gone more than she was home. Maddie was gone more than she was home these days, bird watching. Terry, the red haired doctor, had moved to the Navajo reservation up north to work, not because he had head rights. Father William looked like he had what people in Pitnam call Pitman call a case of the nerves. The last time I'd really had a chance to talk with Maddie, she'd said there was trouble in the air. Esperanza and Esteban were going to have to be moved to a safe house farther from the border. The two best possibilities were Oregon and Oklahoma. Flat, hopeless Oklahoma. What would happen if they stayed here, I asked. Immigration's making noises. They could come in and arrest them, and they'd be deported before you even had time to sit down and think about it. Here, I asked? They would come into your house? Maddie said yes. She also said, as I knew very well, that in that case, Esteban's and Esperanza's lives wouldn't be worth a plug nickel. That just can't be right, I said, that they would do that to a person knowing they'd be killed. There's got to be some other way. The only legal way a person from Guatemala can stay here is if they can prove in court that their life was in danger when they left. But they were, Maddie. You know it. You know what happened to them, to Esperanza's brother and all. I didn't say to their daughter. I wondered if Maddie knew, but of course she would have to. Their own say-so's no good. They have to have hard proof, pictures and documents. She picked up a white wall 
and I thought she was going to throw it across the lot, but she only hoisted it onto the top of a pile beside me. When people run for their lives, they frequently neglect to bring along their file cabinets of evidence, she said. Maddie wasn't often bitter, but when she was, she was. I didn't want to believe the world could be so unjust, but of course it was right there in front of my nose. If the truth was a snake, it would have bitten me a long time ago. It would have had me for dinner.